My name's Dan, and I'm here as a member of the Museum of American Armor in Bethpage, New York. We're going to talk about some of the weapons commonly found and encountered in the Second World War. The first thing to realize is that most of the world fought the Second World War with First World War weapons. That is, rifles that were manually operated, and after each shot, the rifle would have to be loaded again for each shot. That changed in a big way in the Second World War when the U.S. adopted the U Model M1 rifle. What this gave the American servicemen in 1936 and on was ruggedness, reliability, accuracy, and for the first time in a major world power, firepower. This rifle, loaded with an eight round end block clip, simply had to be loaded once and then could be fired all eight shots without reloading the rifle. It did it semi automatically. Would you like to see a I'd love firing. to see a, uh, a live fire so demo. So what we'll do is do a blank firing of the M1 Garand. We're going to move over to the side where it's a little bit safer. Yeah. We'll do a blank firing demonstration of the US M1 rifle. We're going to take an eight round end block clip of blanks. They're inserted into the rifle. Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! Easy to clear and ready to fire again. The reproduction clips don't always come out the way they're supposed to. Now we've got a jam in the rifle. That's due to blanks and modern reproduction clips. We'll compare that to the World War I Springfield rifle. These were manually loaded with a five round stripper clip. The rounds are pushed into the breech, the bolt is closed, fire in the hole, fire in the hole. And the rifle had to be manually operated for each successive round. That's the mechanism that every other army used in the Second World War, manually operated bolt-action rifle. The firepower enabled by the M1 with its semi-automatic design far outweighed the firepower that an enemy force could bring upon an American squad. The American strategy of fire and maneuver, the sergeant would yell for a base of fire, Every rifleman could fire a bunch of cartridges as quickly and rapidly as possible. The enemy would be suppressed, they would keep their head down, the American squad could move forward and capture the ground and hold it. There were other guns, such as the model of 1918, the Browning Automatic Rifle, which was actually considered a secret weapon upon its adoption in the First World War. Patents for this rifle were not filed, lest German agents actually find out how the mechanism works kind of archaic, it's heavy, it's bulky, it's 19 and a half pounds, fired the full power 30 caliber ammunition from a 20 round box magazine. Nobody wanted to carry it because of its weight and bulk, but when you were shooting at people, when they were shooting back, it was a great asset, a great tool. Another American weapon was everyone's favorite, the M1 carbine. Basically a lightweight weapon, very easy to carry. And it was designed for more forces behind the lines, mechanics, clerks, things like that nature, where you probably wouldn't need the expense and weight of a full power rifle. The problem with this rifle was in its application. Many GIs would grab it because of its light weight. I used to work with a gentleman that was a World War II Navy veteran, his brother having served in Europe, they took notes at the end of the war. His brother related to my friend that he could tell who had been shot by what in the middle of a battle. My friend Harold said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, the guy was knocked over backwards. One of the Browning automatics hit him. If the enemy soldier fell to the ground crumpled up, he was hit by the M1 or the Springfield rifle. If he saw that enemy soldier fall to his knees, somebody shot him with the Thompson. He said if he saw the enemy soldier wince and continue coming, somebody shot him with an M1 carbine, and they had to shoot him again. There are several different versions of submachine guns. One of the earliest guns adopted by the United States was the M1928 Thompson submachine gun. Beautifully crafted, manufactured by Colt, it had what could really be considered luxury features for a military small arm. Finned barrel, cuts compensator, a stock that could come off and probably become lost and you wouldn't be able to find it when you needed it. 
could fire from a 20 round detachable box magazine. This particular model would also accept drum magazines. Very complicated, very expensive to manufacture. Even the internal mechanism of the 1928 Thompson was complicated and overbuilt. Each gun contained an oiler pad. So as the gun cycled as you mowed down your enemies, the gun oiled itself, keeping itself clean and reliable. Not a necessary feature. It also contained a device called the Blish Lock, a bronze lock that would contain the pressure of the 45 caliber cartridge. GIs found out that if they left it out, the gun worked exactly the same without it. One less part to machine. It also had a movable firing pen, complicated, costly to make. The replacement for that was the M1A1, where the bolt was simply one solid chunk of metal with a fixed firing pin, no other parts necessary. That submachine gun was standardized eventually into the M1A1 submachine gun. The rear sight was no longer adjustable, it was just a simple fixed piece of steel. It used the same magazines, same rate of fire, same cartridge. No more expensive fin barrel, no more compensator necessary. Very rugged, very reliable. This got down to a wartime cost of about $145 per gun. The United States took note of what our enemies and allies were doing. Germany, the leader in sheet metal construction, the elegant MP40 submachine gun. Very reliable, prized by GIs as a souvenir. Not to be outdone, the British simply took a piece of tubing welded machine gun stuff to it and had the Sten gun. Very reliable, very inexpensive. The Americans, in their quest to make a cheaper gun but also make it complicated, went to General Motors and they used the hubcap machine from the guide lamp division. They stamped out a right half and a left half. We welded them together and they created the M3 submachine gun. Total government cost in World War II, $14.50. Quite a savings. This, action, this gun actually served well on into the 1990s very popular for storage in tanks because it took up very little space. It's a reliable gun. We'll move over to heavy machine guns. Section 3. Yes. The brand new automatic rifle. 1918A2. BAR. Yeah. Yep. We've got a couple of machine guns here from basically World War I technology. One great anecdote about the adoption of the 1917 was that its designer, John Browning, had to sell it to the government. So he brought it to Washington, D.C., and he had competition from Colt and Vickers, which are also excellent machine gun designs. He was very determined to sell his gun, so he set it up and began firing. In the year 1917, mechanical devices were not as reliable as today. Mr. Browning kept this gun running for 45 minutes continuously firing over 2,000 rounds of ammunition, no stoppages and no breakages. The government was pretty impressed. But they asked the inventor, Mr. Browning, all right, your gun obviously works. How many tools are required to keep this gun running? And the inventor was probably a little bit insulted because he designed the entire gun to be disassembled with a simple cartridge. Every job that could be done on this gun could be done with either the case of the cartridge or the point. The whole gun could be reassembled. If you took the last gun ever assembled, ever built, and the first one, all the parts would interchange and work. You got to design that right. This would be the internal workings of a Browning machine gun. It's not a very portable gun. It's heavy to lug around. They needed a more portable version, so the United States developed and adopted the 1919 A4 light machine gun. Same basic receiver box, same basic mechanism, with a much lighter barrel assembly. Very reliable gun, very rugged fed from the same belted ammunition. If it could be said that there was a drawback to this weapon, it's that having a water-cooled lineage, there was no method to change the barrel quickly. All the parts of the machine gun had to be removed from the rear of the gun, the barrel changed, and then reassembled and reinserted into the gun. Probably could be done in a minute if you didn't have a determined enemy pressing your position, causing stress with a bayonet charge, hand grenades, or enemy fire. The Germans also had a need for a machine gun, and they adopted the MG42. Feared and respected by all who came across it on both sides, the rate of fire of over 1,200 rounds a minute meant 20 pieces of lead coming at you per second. A very dangerous force to be dealt with. The Germans, understanding the amount that he created, needed a way to change the barrel quickly. 
not like the American method of removing everything out the back. The Germans simply put a latch on the side of the gun. You open the latch, you took the barrel out, you put the new one in, and in less than six seconds, your gun could be firing again. A very reliable, rugged weapon, very feared.